When it comes to picking the right parts for your next gaming PC, there are lots of easy mistakes you can make, and lots of individual components that have launched over the last year or so you just shouldn't buy. So in this video, I'm going to be walking you through what they are, including both specific examples of parts I just can't recommend, but also some easy rules to follow that can help you to avoid making big mistakes when it comes to the right CPU, GPU, RAM or motherboard as we head into 2025. This one could be a little controversial, but let's dive into it. Today's video has been made possible by Geeker PC, pre-built gaming PCs with parts you actually should buy. If you're based here in the UK, you can now buy some of the systems we feature on the channel directly from us. We may not be the cheapest, but we aim to deliver great quality and offer part customization too. Learn more at the first links in the description below. Now my aim with this video isn't just to necessarily flame individual components, though I will be doing a little bit of that, but also to inform you across each of the different component categories of some key things to look out for. So let's start with the big ones, CPUs and GPUs, but feel free to use the timestamps to skip through to your, well, desired component you want to see flamed. Now let's start off with CPUs. Now what I would have said in this video, say six months ago, was don't buy Intel 14th gen. Obviously there were well documented issues with that lineup. And now I'm saying don't buy Core Ultra, which basically means I'm saying don't buy an Intel CPU. Uh, yeah. I don't want to be the latest person to pile onto the Intel bandwagon because I think what they've done with Core Ultra is a step in the right direction. There's just still, well, a lot of work to do. Efficiency is now better, but performance is now, well, kind of worse. Yeah. The reason I say don't buy Core Ultra is because there's just too many problems with the architecture. The performance drop off versus an equivalent AMD Ryzen chip just makes them not good value for money in the current market. And while pricing on these chips may start to fall, I'm not particularly hopeful this is going to happen anytime soon. Plus, the motherboards you can pick up for these CPUs tend to be more expensive than their AMD counterparts, especially if you want access to features like overclocking, which on Intel are reserved for the top end chipset. The only area really where Intel beats out AMD is on multi core performance. So if you are happening to build a top of the range video editing PC, you might want to consider the Core Ultra 9 with its massive core and thread counts, as it is going to deliver better performance than, say, AMD's own Ryzen 9 9950X. But AMD aren't free of my critique in today's video because they, wow, they've got some problems in their own lineup too, which you really should consider when buying a new CPU. Now, when it comes to AMD, their Ryzen 9000 lineup wasn't received particularly well either. Instead, making these last gen Ryzen 7000 chips arguably a better buy. Now, Ryzen 9000 brings with it, like Intel's Core Ultra, more efficiency. And unlike Core Ultra, which was actually kind of slower, at least Ryzen 9000 is a little quicker, just not enough to justify the price increase. Now, in some instances, like the Ryzen 5 9600X versus 7600X, the price parity is getting closer and a little bump in cost may well be worth it. However, you should consider, especially for high-end gaming, the X3D lineup of chips above all else. X3D is AMD's stacked cache technology that basically relieves the biggest bottleneck in modern gaming CPUs, which is L3 cache. They stack the cache on top of each other and give you way more of it, which in turn unlocks extra performance. So keep an eye out for the existing 9800X3D, which is getting better as far as stocking and availability goes, and of course for future X3D chips. I'd expect to see a Ryzen 9 9900X, X3D, 9950X3D, heck, even maybe Ryzen 5 9600X3D, potentially as early as CES next year. If you are looking for some parts, by the way, you should buy for each component category, I'll leave some good options down below for Amazon and Newegg with latest pricing and availability too. But what about the other side of the performance equation, the graphics card? And I have to apologize slightly because again, Nvidia's 4060 sort of falls in my crosshairs. And my opinions on this card versus when it first launched have actually softened and I'll explain why in a moment. The biggest criticism I had of this and AMD's Radeon 7600, which doesn't get off lightly either, is VRAM, which brings me on to my next point. Buy GPUs that have enough video memory. The 4060, as a prime example, was hammered when it first launched for its lack of VRAM. It has eight gigabytes, it should have 10 or 12, just a fact. The 4060 Ti is arguably even worse as the extra VRAM there is even more important because it actually holds the card back to an even higher degree. We're hoping that AMD and Nvidia will 
learn the mistakes they made with video memory in the next gen, but let me explain why it's a problem. Look for example at Hogwarts Legacy. Check out the VRAM on the 4060 versus the Radeon 7700 XT. Because the 7700 XT has so much more VRAM, it can utilize that better and help to unlock more frame rate in those VRAM demanding titles. And Hogwarts, by the way, isn't the only game where VRAM usage is getting more and more important. What's more, let's say you pick up this card and it's got eight gigs of VRAM, which is fine for now at 1080p. In a year's time or two years time when new games have dropped, the chances are that VRAM is not gonna be enough. Now I'm not suggesting that you have to future-proof every element of your build, because frankly, that's not possible. But it's always good if you can and you're looking at components at similar prices to maximize where possible. And VRAM is a big area you wanna do that. Now the reason I say my opinion on the 4060 specifically has softened is because I see a lot of people recommending last gen's 3060 instead on the basis of VRAM alone. But this is a much quicker card and side by side, even though it's constrained by video memory and should really have some more, is a better GPU for most people than the 3060. So next gen, keep an eye out for those cards with more VRAM. I'm sure AMD or Nvidia and we don't know who, one of them will get it wrong. So capitalize on the one that gets it right. And hopefully then whoever hasn't listened will listen. For 1080p, 10 gigabytes of VRAM or more, maybe 12. For 1440p, 12, but preferably 14 or 16. For 4K, 1620, or if I'm feeling particularly greedy, 24. You don't need 24, 20 will be fine. You get the point. Get rid of that, let's carry on. Now I've talked about CPUs and GPUs, shall we touch upon memory? I'll keep it really simple. In 2025 and beyond, you want 32 gigabytes of RAM for gaming at a minimum. If you're gonna be doing video editing, rendering, look at 48, 64, heck, even towards 128 gigabytes. But for gaming, 32 gigs is what you want. The mistake you can make isn't necessarily buying a Corsair Vengeance kit. It would be buying this Corsair Vengeance kit. And that applies for Kingston, XPG, Team Group, and G-Skill. What do I mean by that? Well, this particular kit, it has a relatively slow 5600 megahertz clock speed and a, well, very slow cast latency. What you want to do is make sure you're buying the kit with a high enough speed, so 6000 megahertz or mega transfers or higher, and a cast latency in and around 30. You don't want to go much higher than this as you're going to nullify lots of the extra bandwidth and performance and speed benefits of DDR5 versus last gen DDR4. To memory, I'll keep it super simple, 32 gigabytes with a low cast latency and you should be good to go. It's not a case of don't buy Corsair, it's a case of buy Corsair. Says lowest latency, fastest kit. They're just my example for today's video. So we've talked about short-term storage. Let's talk about long-term storage, SSDs. Three things you need to know about SSDs. The generation is what's gonna determine the speed. And there are three current popular generations. Three, four, and five. These link to the PCI generation and determine the amount of bandwidth the SSD can possibly use through the slot it's installed to on the motherboard. Now a Gen 3 SSD is gonna cap out at around about three to four gigabytes per second on the read and the write. A Gen 4 drive will cap out at double, so you're looking seven, eight gigabytes a second. Gen 5 will cap out at double again, so 15, 16 gigabytes a second. Some of the Gen 4 drives will be below that upper limit, but they're pretty much always higher than the upper limit of the lower generation. So a Gen 4 drive will always be quicker than a Gen 3 drive, generally speaking, and a Gen 5 drive will always be quicker than a Gen 4 drive. Gen 5 is currently what I would class as enthusiasts. So for gaming, it's just not necessary. However, with those texture files getting so big, game files getting so big, you need to load more and more data off your storage and into your memory. And that's where a bigger, faster Gen 4 drive can be really important. Now, as far as components you want to avoid, you want to avoid the Gen 4 drives that are the price of the Gen 5 alternatives. You always want to maximize speed when it comes to SSDs. Check out the endurance figures. That's how many times the drive can be read to and written from before buying. But stick with Gen 4 and you should again help to minimize bottlenecking. Now the next area to discuss is motherboards. And this is again where things have changed a lot this year. With any launch of any new CPU, we see new motherboard chipsets. So Intel have got Z890 and we're expecting to see cheaper B and H series lineups in the new year. AMD have got X870. Again, we're expecting to see B850, B840, whatever whatever they're gonna call it, land in January as well. The thing with motherboards to bear in mind is that the connection standards on the board you buy determines the maximum speed of the components you can install. If you want a board, gonna use the F word again, no, not that one, future-proofing, going for a Gen 5 compatible board as just one example is a great way of ensuring you're good now and into the future. And there's the fantastic thing about X870 as one example is you can upgrade to CPUs right through to 2027. That's what AMD have committed.
related to on the socket. You're not going to be able to leverage that functionality if you've got a board that has an out of date interface. Similarly, make sure you've got Gen 5 support for things like SSDs, really important. Z890, it's a shame because there's some genuinely awesome boards like this Unify from MSI is sick. I just can't quite see a situation with the state of the core ultra lineup where you would buy one of these. What I'm getting at is maybe um, maybe avoid Z890. The other thing with other boards, the other mistake you don't want to make is be aware that existing X670 and B650 chipset boards, they're of course what launched with Ryzen 7000, may not be compatible with Ryzen 9000 out of the box. The socket is all good, the board is all good, but you may need to apply a BIOS update. That's pretty easy to do, but the motherboard needs to have BIOS flash functionality. If it doesn't, you can only upgrade by buying a compatible CPU, upgrading the BIOS and putting a new one in. You want one where you can just chuck a USB in the back, hold a button on the rear I.O. and regardless of whether or not you've got a CPU installed, it's going to do its magic and get itself up to speed. Hopefully you found this video pretty informational and powerful so far. So what do we talk about? Power supplies! I'll see myself out. A couple of things to note with power supplies. ATX3, you want that. PCI Gen 5 power cable built in, you want that. And you also want a good efficiency rating. 80 plus is not going out of fashion, but it is falling away on some designs with cybernetics now coming on board. 80 plus and cybernetics both serve basically the same purpose. They're an independent board that look to validate the efficiency of the power supply you're going to buy. And both of the certifications, in my opinion, are more than enough to put any worries you have aside. 80 plus bronze, is a lower efficiency than silver, gold, platinum, titanium, etc. And you see a similar colour system inspired by, I guess, the metal system with Fibernetics. As far as wattage is concerned, people often ask me, James, how much do I need? You don't need probably as much as what some of you think. Take all your build, chuck it into PC Part Picker, grab the wattage figure in the top right corner and add 30%. Why 30%? All power supplies have a bit of power loss, up to 20% on the 80 plus standard. So 30% gives you a bit of wiggle room and also allows for things like transient power spikes where your components grab loads of power immediately having some extra headroom can be useful that isn't to say you need to buy a 1200 watt power supply for an rtx 4070 based system it's plainly overkill and a waste of your money but stick with a reputable brand check the reviews ltt labs do do some really good power supply testing and while that's not an exhaustive list then using an expensive psu tester to essentially push psus to their limits and ensure the wattage is going to be good and with that we're nearly there just pc cases left to go and this is an area where well i'm going to point you to our upcoming video on the best pc cases to buy in 2025 if that's not out yet get subscribed you don't want to miss it cases are such a personal decision and really depend on a lot of factors but what i'd say is avoid cases that really restrict airflow and if you're gonna go for a fish tank case anything that's inspired by the o11 from lee and lee there are loads of options now and tech have got one the ca corsair has got one in the 6500 i mean heck even thermal take have got fish tank inspired pc cases nowadays be aware that that choice to prioritize how good the system looks and how easy it is to see inside is going to come at the expense of airflow and temperatures. You want a chassis that's going to give you good cooling and there's nothing wrong with making a, in my opinion, a small cooling sacrifice in order to actually gain a better aesthetic edge, but be aware that that's a decision you're making. Check the clearances for radiators, the height of CPU tower air coolers and the length of GPUs before buying and make sure your power supply fits too. Some of the big long power supplies can cause incompatibility issues in more places than you might think. And that really is it. Some components in this video then that you really shouldn't buy, but also hopefully some rules you can take with you so that whatever launches at CES in the new year and Computex even later than that, you can help ensure you get a good deal and only end up with decent parts in your system that at least try to do a little bit of future proofing and don't see your system suffer with too many bottlenecks. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to get subscribed. We'll of course be covering all the new stuff that comes out over the next year or so and we're expecting loads, which is really exciting and you can see our thoughts on all of that stuff as and when it drops. Thanks again for watching and as always we'll see you in the next one.